in 2005, and he will catch us up on whatever what, whatever aspect he decided. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen, the, haven't seen this yet. <laughs> I'm sorry to cut that discussion short. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, just a couple of highlights of things we've worked on over the years at MPG North, maybe some ideas of what we can do uh, going forward. Just kind of try and paint a picture of it. Uh, I threw this in, this map over lunch. Uh, you know, I was surprised to see so many faces, you know, the, the number of faces I don't recognize here. Uh, and we, we uh, you know, haven't seen a map of this. I know everybody's really familiar with the ranch and then Missoula here. Um, north, like Philip said, that's where we started this show, uh, up in the Swan Valley there. Uh, so just kind of an engaging thing to start with. So recently I put some game cameras up on a couple elk car carcasses. We had two dead cow elk at MPG North. And uh, so it was fun to look at those videos. You know, our Facebook page, we show lots of uh, what gets on these carcasses. <clears throat> so there was one scavenger on the carcass for over 16 nights of uh, one game camera. This scavenger racked up 55 hours, and its biggest night was eight hours. So there was a one hour delay on the camera. So every hour, just like clockwork, this animal is back there. They just never left. Successfully defended this carcass against other scavengers. The dominant scavenger, what was it? Louder? Nope. Who said skunk? Striped skunk, very good. Free ice cream cone. <laughs> it was the striped skunk. This is supposed to be playing automatically, but it's not. Oh, it is, but we can't see that it's playing. All right, whatever. I'll ignore that problem. Um, yeah, this guy, you know, the, well, there's a still of this later. And I hope this next video actually does play because it's the much more fun one. Now I don't even have a mouse. Why not? Okay, there. It, it doesn't like something about what's happening now. I did try this earlier to see if it would. It's not going to work here either. I want to show it so bad, I'm going to go back to the. Uh, I'm just going to grab it off of the. Huh, very interesting issue. Okay. I assumed it wouldn't work because these things don't work usually when you try to do them. So here we go. Okay, that's why it doesn't work. Okay, no big deal. Um, <laughs> blue screen time. Cool. All right. This, this one shows a coyote that comes in, uh, you know, it's kind of sniff around at the carcass. And the skunk, you, can, you see its eyes from over here. It runs in and the coyote, you know, you see its reaction. Oh, I hear something over there. I guess I'll just kind of try to walk off. And the skunk just fully chases it clear out of the range, <laughs> which is pretty cool. The coyote later came back with a posse and uh, was finally able, but I don't think they chased the skunk off. I think that the skunk just grew too fat to be able to deal with it anymore. Look at that skunk, right? Okay, so as an engaging piece, you know, what's a skunk got to do with it? Um, which I had stuck in my head last night. Uh, there's only one way to eat a carcass, right? A skunk is not a big animal, and an elk is a really big animal. So how do you eat a carcass? One bite at a time, right? So uh, the question I want to ask about our work at MPG North, it's the same question we have at the ranch too, is, have we finished eating yet? You know, when, and when are we done eating? And well, I'm, with specifically, I'm talking about restoration work and our mission at what we're trying to do at MPG. So uh, it, with reference to MPG North, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's, you know, a couple of things we've done up there, maybe a little bit about what we've learned, some, a couple of things I've thought about doing in the future, and some uh, things that I could use a little help on maybe, or, you know, expertise. Uh, and. Um, a couple suggestions of ways that you know we can continue to move forward with with the work up there, um, and the, a lot of these themes, a lot of the things I bring up are gonna. It's um, Philip's talk and Kate's talks in particular today. I think set the stage for this pretty well. So a lot of the things are you know what is restoration? How do you know if restoration's done? 
Um, how can we use birds to tell what's happening with our restoration? So you'll see a lot of those same things here. Uh, historically, I can't go back to Lewis and Clark or, you know, previous, um, at least I, have not, I haven't really tried in this one, but I can go back to 1966. So again, this is our reference conditions, this aerial photography from then, and that, I mean, the property boundary is essentially the edge of this photograph. And there's a comparison here. That's the same year that Plum Creek first cut MPG North and they cut the whole thing. Uh, there were no SMZ laws then, so they could just cut everywhere. Uh, so this is 1966, 2012, and you know, at some point, at, at, in some ways, I feel like I can just stop the talk now. You know, I, I ask the question, "Are we finished yet?" Well, no, right? Because that's what it looked like, and this is what it looks like right now. So, but is this is this really what the goal should be? Do we want just a carpet of trees again? That was the reference condition. That is typical habitat for the swan. But much like in the Bitterroot, where there's you know, Philip brought up changes in climate. Western Montana's had a ton of development. We don't have fire like we had, especially in a developed valley like the Swan Valley. Um, there's, it's a different situation, so we shouldn't expect the, the pre-current situation plant community to provide the same benefits now as it did then, or at least we should wonder if it would. <clears throat> so rather than say, well, I just want it to be a carpet of trees, which is a few years ago is kind of what I did think would be the best idea, I decided, well, why don't we measure what's there and sort of look at, look at the plant communities there, look at what we can learn from animals there, and see if they'll tell us something about where we should go. Uh, we set up a grid. You've been seeing grids this whole time. I'm really lucky that the property is small, so we could set up a pretty tight grid. And uh, you know, several people today have brought up the idea that the further away your points are, the less you know about the, the, what's happening between the points, right? So this is a 30-meter grid. These points are all 30 meters apart, and really, you know, if I had hundreds of acres of a monoculture exotic grass plantation, I wouldn't need a 30 meter grid in there. But again, look at the heterogeneity and the, the, the hard edges on this landscape. I mean, one acre to the next is a, a different biome almost, you know. So that the, the point density just really, be, we, we realized quickly that it was going to be totally necessary. We, uh, I worked with the veg crew, came up with some really quick methods to learn about kind of the functional characteristics of the plant community and some of the dominant plant species at each of these points. You know, we didn't do exhaustive surveys at each point. Canopy cover, tree species, tree heights and at different levels, and then shrub and, and ground cover, major species, particularly whether they're exotic or, or native. Um, and really thanks to the veg crew, it was a ton of work uh, and they did it really fast and they did a great job. The data was super helpful to do this, which was Debbie's work. I worked with her a little bit. Um, Debbie's producing maps for everybody. You're, you know, real, real important to us here. And we were able to use that to come up with some broad habitat zone classifications in this overlay. Uh, we, we wanted to keep it really simple. Um, so we came up with just five different zones. I mean, it's a small property, so that makes sense. Uh, green is a mixed forest. Of course, that's the most common, you know, habitat zone up here. Blue is uh, riparian, and that's both presence of water and there's some vegetation characteristics we use to assign that. Pink is deciduous woodlands. Uh, aspen, cottonwood, are the, the, and birch are the major trees that would form a deciduous woodland up there. Uh, let's see, this kind of gray, blue is aquatic or kind of wetland habitat, you know, standing water. And then yellow is these uh, fields, we call them. And there's other open areas you can see from the visual imagery, but if the open area has mostly trees in it, that's one thing. If these areas, as you'll, uh, I'm going to talk much more about later, the fields have some remnant trees, but the whole way that they're operating is a little bit different trajectory. So we've called them a different thing. And then if I make that habitat zone map just 100% opaque there, I've also separated those five zones into two classes. And Really, there are some subclasses going on, but for simplicity, I'm kind of sticking it to. But basically, each zone has a solid color, which means that based on the vegetation that's there, uh, and we created thresholds for all these habitats, and I can talk a lot more specifically about that with people later if they like. Um, but if it's, if it's the solid color, then we feel like, you know, its trajectory is towards kind of the, the conditions that we would like. Um, in, most, in most cases on the property, that's a more or less closed canopy forest. It's going to shade out invasives, has diverse tree species. Uh, and then where you have the textured polygons, 
we feel like that trajectory is either a really long ways off or it's inhibited in some way. Uh, so it may be that it's all even age lodgepole coming up in a clear cut. That seems to be associated with a depauperate understory community and few shrubs. Wildlife don't tend to hang out there as I'll show you pretty soon. So that's one way that these, these forest areas, for example, could be you know, kind of an unhealthy class or whatever. Um, deciduous woodlands, riparian, there's, there's some of this unhealthy class everywhere. Invasive species uh, in the open areas are what really helped us define that. If the percent cover of native species was much higher than everything else, it's an unhealthy area. And then these fields, uh, by definition, we kind of call that an unhealthy habitat. And mostly just because, again, that trajectory where we feel like it's going isn't what's going to benefit wildlife. And I'll spend a lot more time on that. Uh, so status, how do we get there and what have we been doing so far to address these problems? Well, anyone who uh, saw Philip's video this morning of us, that was back in 2007, I think. All of us, plant, we've planted a lot of shrubs up at MPG North. Uh, I went back through records of how many we've purchased and sort of used that to estimate how many we've planted. And then I rounded that to the nearest thousand. So who's got a guess? It's, it's a little less than that. It's actually like way less than that. I got 12, I got nine, I got 6,000 free ice cream. Oh. Two people said it simultaneously. Who else said it? You said, okay. 60,000 shrubs. That'd be sweet. That's probably like the total number of lodgepole pines that are up. No, not, there's more lodgepole than that. 6,000 seedlings since 2007. And this map is going to get pretty colorful here for a while, but I'll try and walk you through it as best I can. So these polygons laid over the top here, the different colors are from different years that we planted. The years aren't really relevant right now, but these are just the boundaries where we've planted something. We've planted conifer species, shrub species, deciduous trees, birch, you know, lots of different things we've tried in different areas for specific reasons. Uh, and they are growing. We've been monitoring these, and for the past two years, we've had really consistent monitoring methods across all of these different individual plots. We kind of walk a transect through the plots, take some measurements, and then use that to generalize to the population. These are just the sort of deciduous shrubs, but there again, there's deciduous trees, conifers, and everything's growing. Uh, there's a few species that, that don't seem to be get, putting a lot of height on, but in general, people are, are people. Shrubs are taken off. Uh, hawthorn and chokecherry, they've been stagnant for a long time. You see they're still, you know, three feet tall, but we're seeing, you know, significant differences in the mean height of the population. Um, and those in alder we planted pretty recently and they've just taken off like crazy. This green dashed line is my best estimate of browse height at MPG North from a bunch of measurements. So we still have a ways to go before, we, before these uh, shrubs are going to get out of their nets and start actually providing a benefit to the, the land and the wildlife up there. But they're growing and that's a really positive sign. Uh, over this time, last year and this year, uh, last year being 2011-2012, uh, 4.5 percent annual mortality that tends to when the first year mortality can be a lot higher and so and we've planted a little bit every year and so there have been a couple of species where we'll have 20 percent or more cottonwood for example they got hit with cottonwood leaf beetle a lot of them died western hemlock a lot of them died I'd say with a lot of these species particularly conifers and deciduous trees that we plant other than cottonwood the mortality even in the planting year is two percent or less so we've got planting down pretty well what I want to get down next is how do we make them grow faster, right? This is kind of what a lot of the restoration plots up there look like. This is aspen. And as you can see, you know, like I said, they're, they're four feet tall. Aspen grow tall pretty fast. Um, this picture was taken in the fall. That's why they, they're just, the leaves are changing. Uh, so they're, they're, they're doing what they need to do. They need to grow. But, you know, we're not there yet with them. Here's some hawthorns. Um, um, and, and they, you know, it's the same thing. They're nice and green. Uh, they are developing good thorns, which are going to protect them from browse, but they're not outside of these nets yet. They're not over them and they're not, uh, they're not any wider. Uh, and what, one thing we want these shrubs to do is provide wildlife habitat, and that could be nesting habitat. With these hawthorns in particular, we want big thickets that are shading out weeds and keeping animals from kind of wanting to walk through them. And we can plant other things inside and use the, you know, use the hawthorns as a living exclosure. So we're, we're on the right path, um, so, but, but we're not there yet with the growth. And then the other thing I notice when I look at the habitat map and then the past planting zones, and I've just cut, recolored them all orange here. So orange is a place where we've planted. All the rest of the colors are habitat zones. 
The coverage doesn't match these sort of unhealthy areas. I mean, in some places it does, kind of along the, the riparian area up here. We've planted pretty heavily in there. Um, here was kind of a similar story. We've planted some of the edges around these fields at one time, kind of thinking that the plantings would, would kind of grow out into the field. But then these big kind of lodgepole dominated kind of dry, poor understory areas, we haven't really done much in. And this big clear cut at the southern end of the property, haven't done much there. So, uh, you know, to the extent that we have more, more work to do, uh, what should these areas look like in the future? Um, and what can we learn from birds about what, what can birds tell us about what they should look like in the future? So this is a report I just finished. Um, this is a couple of diagrams from it. Um, these are the, the 13 bird point counts that have been established since 2010, I think even 2009 maybe, uh, at MPG North. Um, species richness does vary. I'll walk you through this diagram a little bit. So each, at the center and bottom of each of these cylinders is a count point. And it's the same protocol as the ranch. Visit them twice in the breeding season, once in the winter. And we make other bird observations year round as well and do a standard point count. The radius of each of these cylinders is 100 meters. I've limited the data of, of observations to that so that we're not saying that, you know, this, this point happens to have more species because they heard a bunch of Canada geese on the Swan River that day. Uh, and it also, that way you're not counting one really loud bird like a Swainson's thrush that you can just hear forever in the forest. You're not counting the same Swainson's thrush from multiple points. Uh, so that's, so this is all limited to 100 meters. It's not a perfect guarantee, but we would like to say that if we're detecting a singing bird within 100 meters of that point, you know, it's likely nesting there, and that's the sort of inference we'd like to make. And if it, the bird is flying over and doesn't appear to be using the habitat, we mark that as a flyover and then don't include it in this analysis. So this is our, my best attempt at including the birds that are defending territories within that circle. Then these cylinders, the height of them off the ground, is all scaled to the richness. So 24 species within this from 2010 to 2012 is the, the species richness in this area. So that's, I kind of set that at an altitude in Google Earth and then scaled the height of all the rest of the cylinders to that as a maximum. So you know, 24 is the max, 14 here is the minimum, for example, 14 is the shortest cylinder. So this is almost, you know, in a way, this is kind of a space filling model. This is kind of the volume that, you know, describes how many birds are there. And then the mean abundance across the property is 19. So I scaled that to height and put that at the altitude where it slices through these cylinders. So if the cylinder is above, it's above average species richness. Below is an area with lower than average species richness. 14 to 24 is the min to max. It's not a tremendous difference, right? We're not seeing a place with six bird species and another place with 40. All these sites have some similarity, uh, but I think there are specific reasons to look at some of these low abundance sites and the highest ones and think, well, how could we get 24s or whatever, you know, evenness at high species richness across the property? So we can drop those cylinders onto the ground and just keep the same strategy for averages. So red is below average, green is above average, species richness. Uh, oh, here's a good one. How many total bird species have been, have been recorded at any season, point counts or not, at MPG North since 2007? 91. 66. 91's good. Lower? Lower? 92. Higher? 93. Higher? 94. 95. Free ice cream cone! <laughs> Here, did you pass this back to <laughs> <laughs> I should have said it's a multiple of five. That would have helped, but good job. Um, 95 birds. So, I mean, what's the, total, what's the species count at ranch right now? 200. So this is 200 acres. Okay, the ranch is 10,000. There are a lot of birds here. I mean, it's, it wakes you up at 5 a.m. in June. And you're, I mean, it's just really loud and crazy up here with birds. Um, 95 birds. So again, you know, species richness varies. Does habitat matter? At least the way we've measured it. And kind of looking at this map, it's a little hard to tease out. I mean, so we have this kind of dry lodgepole area 
dominated by a single vegetation community. Yeah, maybe there are fewer nesting structures here. You might expect that. But down here we have kind of a similar looking, you know, mostly conifer forest, and that's the maximum. So this is the minimum richness, this is the maximum richness. On the map they look the same. So the map clearly isn't telling us everything, and if you've spent time at North, you know that this area is actually a lot different than this area. Um, so we're not seeing everything. One thing we are seeing um, uh, is that with just as few years of data that we have, a small scale and lots of annual variation, we probably could look at this for longer and learn more. Uh, but these circles are really arbitrary, right? I mean, when we say that there's 24 bird species in this circle, it's not like quantum theory where they're like an electron and they could equally be in any place in that circle, right? They're probably using particular areas within these. It would be really nice to know exactly where the birds are going, and that's, I've been really encouraged with the iPad uh, apps and the Shrubby Draws work and thinking about some possibilities in this sort of really diverse, edgy habitat, exactly where the birds are going and what they're using. Uh, and also focal observations would help, just if someone wanted to go up and identify one nest and go back week after week for, during the breeding season and just write notes about what that single bird family did. It's anecdotal, but it would be super interesting in sort of thinking about you know, what's important for these birds. Uh, we can, however, the, when we're up there doing the bird point counts, I say we because I have done them, but I've <coughs> handed them off to people that do them a lot better than me. Uh, so I still say we. I'll try and drop it and say they at some point here. Um, they, uh, the bird crew records the habitat that the birds are using uh, for each observation. So here we have the habitat types, and I haven't gone into the classes, you know, the unhealthy, what, healthy, whatever, uh, just for the five, riparian conifer, deciduous woodland. This is the acres of each uh, up there. Total abundance, all detections, 2010 to 2012. And the, this is constrained to within 100 meters, no flyovers, just breeding season point counts, right? So that's 633 observations under those conditions. I mean, that's just a few days of work, really. That's probably six, that's six total days of work. Um, abundance per acre. Now, this is where I look at the fields and I think, you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm calling that an unhealthy habitat, right? It's got the lowest abundance, uh, <clears throat> total abundance, and then the abundance per acre, really low. Uh, species richness, low. Richest per acre, lowest, right? Birds aren't really using this habitat as much as they're using some other ones. Deciduous woodland, on the other hand, we have the highest abundance per acre, the second to the highest species richness, and the highest richness per acre. I mean, a lot of that's an artifact of it only being six acres worth of mapped habitat. If we doubled the amount of deciduous woodland, we wouldn't necessarily see these numbers stay just the same. Species richness per acre on the whole property is 0.26 species doesn't make much sense. Four acres to one species is what that comes down to. So this number wouldn't necessarily hold if it was a lot more territory, but still, you know, total abundance high for the acres, total richness high. Um, don't want to go there yet. So when I'm looking at this data, these data, one thing that's occurring to me is deciduous woodland habitat seems to be really good and fields seem to be pretty unproductive for songbirds. So again, you know, are we done eating the carcass? Are we gonna do some more restoration work? If we are, what should these areas look like? Well, they should look like deciduous woodland if the birds have anything to say about it, is one thing I see here. And there's lots of precedent for that in the literature. I mean, deciduous woodland, kind of open aspen with a lot of shrubs in the understory, you can't get better than that for most wildlife. What can we learn from other wildlife? Well, Kate mentioned this, things like lions and wolves and grizzly bears, they're awesome. They don't tell you much about what's happening on a 200 acre property. Their home ranges are tremendous in size. The blue lines, light blue and dark blue is wolves and coyotes. So they're going everywhere, right? But these, the purple lines are bobcat tracks that I've gone up and just tracked them in the winter, recorded the track over the last two winters. And they're walking these habitual paths. And then, you know, they, they've done this for two years now. Uh, and they, it might be one, it might be multiple. I don't have any marks on them. Uh, and there's other, uh, the, there's orange stuff. Some of it's really hard to see. There's pine mart, American martins and long-tailed weasels in here, skunks. These meso predators and omnivores and smaller mammals do use an area as small as MPG North. And what habitats are they using? Well, you kind of see there's this corridor here. They like the riparian area. They tend to use that frequently. Um, 
nobody's crossing these fields, right? I mean, you know, this wolf makes, even tries to make a U-turn around it to not have to walk across this thing. Um, so maybe we can learn something from that. Uh, these track surveys are really easy to do. They're really fun to do. Uh, you know, take a GPS unit and bushwhack for six hours and try and figure out if a bobcat's gonna finally kill a snowshoe hare or not. It's really fun work. Low cost, it gives great data here, like where, where the animal's going, albeit it's only in the winter, uh, is the easiest time to do it. And it's, it's fantastically underutilized at both North and the ranch. This map here, this is probably Five, this, this is from 2011 until now. This is probably five total days of field work by everybody who did it, right? I mean, if five people from the ranch went up on, you know, once a week from, for the rest of the season, there's snow on the ground now, we would triple this effort in a month, right? So, and we could do the same at the ranch. This is a really good way to find out who's using what and where they're going. Um, so if anyone can go up there while there's snow on the ground this year or after a good snowstorm, I'm still going to be doing it. Uh, it's a really fun way to sort of check out the landscape. And I'm going to spend very little time on this. Um, Alan and I have been working together uh, and have brought some other people in too. We're cataloging all of the images from the Con and Wildlife camera network up there. And uh, it's been in operation since 2007, actually a little, a little earlier. We have tons of trail cam, you know, typical trail cam photography. Most of you are familiar with it. Uh, I can spend more time talking about details later, but we're getting all these image, images cataloged so that we can look somehow at trends of these animals over time. And there's a lot of problems with camera trapping research. If any of you are familiar with it, it's hard to standardize it, hard to say that an animal didn't walk behind the camera and so forth. But with a tremendous amount of data, you can still look at trends. Uh, right now, we have 104,323 images in the database. Um, 22,600 are tagged right now. The other 80,000 were tagged previously, and their import is being uh, automated. By next Friday, we're going to have 104,000 plus images with animals on them tagged in this database. Um, right now, uh, the, of this 22,659 total, uh, there's 16,106 animals on 13,938 images. So the wind will blow a tree around and it'll take a picture, right? Not every picture has an animal. Um, if this percentage holds up, then you know, 80,000 something pictures of animals, right? Um, so far, white-tailed deer, of course, I was going to make that a trivia question, but it was way too easy. I didn't have enough ice cream cones to hand out for that. 10,000 of the 16,000 animals on pictures are white-tailed deer. So get your, you know, it's the last day to get an antlerless hunting permit is tomorrow for the Swan District. Go ahead and get that. Um, what is the second most abundant animal on the camera? I'm not going to do trivia because I think it would take a long time. Um, it, but I'll take one guess if anyone wants to throw a stab at the second most abundant animal on the cameras. That's awesome! <laughs> Red squirrel! And they're very happy about being the second place. <laughs> Look at them just hopping for joy there. How much time have I eaten through? Okay. Okay, so, um, and squirrels, you know, it's funny. And when I first saw that, I thought, it's not, you know, a marten or something. Can't it be something cool that kills things and doesn't annoy me in the morning, right? <laughs> Well, laugh if you want, at least my home range is smaller than this property. Right? We, that's the animals we need to be looking at, is the ones who stay there. They're the ones who are going to tell us if we're doing our job, and they're going to tell us if we can improve what we're doing. So, you know, how much of the carcass is left? I know it's kind of a silly metaphor, but I've been looking at a lot of carcass videos. So, like, I dream about dead animals with bird shit all over them, right? Because um, that's what carcass videos look like. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that isn't really a good thing to just tell everybody, but um, <laughs> so what are some ideas I have for work that we can be doing? And I want to come back to these fields, these yellow areas here. Well, what's the problem with these areas anyway? I kind of tried to make a case that the birds aren't using them. <laughs> Uh, but compared to that 1996 picture, this is habitat diversity compared to 1996. That was all conifer forest. This is now an open area that it creates an additional niche for some species to exploit if you're into niche theory, right? Uh, and with less fire in the valley, with lots of development in the valley, who knows, with climate change, maybe these open areas, you know, we're certainly not going to have big valley fires like happened centuries ago in the Swan. They're going to put those out. They're not going to let 
that kind of fire burn. Maybe we need to be creating and maintaining openings for a time. Um, these fields, as I kind of said with birds and just anecdotally, we don't see elk grazing the, the exotic forage grasses in there. We don't have any cows there, right, which would be bad too. Um, we, you know, just in general, these areas seem to be avoided by a lot of wildlife species. I think we can do better than these fields as they are now. So what, what, uh, what's sort of the picture that's going on there? This is a 2005 exclosure set up by Mark Vandermeer and planted. It's matted underneath to deal with the grass competition, right? Uh, this is actually a really productive, very rich soil, which is kind of a sideline story. The soil shouldn't actually be there. It was dredged from a wetland. And uh, that's a really interesting story. I can talk more about it some other time. But basically, the take home message is if you kill the grass and plant stuff in it, they grow really, really well. So there's no, there's no problem with the soil there of getting anything to grow. But if you just put up an exclosure and plant nothing in it since 2005, nothing. Right? I mean, the same woods rose is there that was there the first day I visited the property, and that's it. There's some kind of weedy forbs taken off in there, too. Um, so this area isn't really going to change much at all in, until, in, during the next interglacial, unless we do something, right? It's uh, mostly timothy, there's some other exotic grasses in there, and then there's a lot of Canada thistle. Um, my my uh, strategy in the past used to be, well, let's, let's create some shrub and tree islands in there to create some shade and keep planting around them and kind of walk that restoration out. But then I started thinking about, you know, what else could we do? And what about a native bunch grass dominated system? And uh, Dan and I have talked about this a little bit. I've mentioned it to plenty of other people. Uh, I've really been intrigued with some of the methods that I'm hearing uh, about coming out in the ranch. I'm looking forward to hearing more talks about um, how, can, how we can use um, kind of novel tools to do some uh, grassland restoration. Maybe if we have rough, rough fescue and blue wild rye dominated uh, system in here with more forbs, that will benefit the elk herds that are kind of always running around and getting pre you know, high pressure in the Swan Valley. Um, may, would birds benefit from this? I took this picture of an American kestrel last year uh, up there, female. And this is a nest box on the property that in 2010, or 2011 had a successful nesting pair. It was the last time that camera operated. I saw a male and female checking it out last year. I don't think they nested there. Um, well, here are the birds that we've recorded in that area, eastern kingbird, tree swallow, kestrels, uh, both species of kind of common bluebirds, uh, western meadowlarks. They've all shown up there. So birds that tend to prefer open areas and grassland areas, they are stopping and checking this, this area out. Uh, and, and nesting there. Tree swallows fill nest boxes with cameras. We have lots of pictures of that. So these birds are using these areas. Yeah, before I say something like, we can benefit birds with a rough fescue prairie, I want to know what's happening to some of these birds. Are they successful? Uh, or, or is this a sink? Are these young birds that are getting pushed off of more productive habitats and having to choose this small uh, grassland? We do have lots of cameras and feeder stations set up so we can monitor these birds, particularly if we were able to band them. You know, we could see what they're doing if they show up in successive years. I would love to get, I mean, I don't know if they have satellite transmitters small enough for kestrels yet, but it would be so neat to see if kestrels came back here uh, in successive years. Banding, of course, would be a lot cheaper. Um, but if, if we were able to, to trap and, and get some sort of instrumentation or marking on these kestrels, I think that would be really useful. Uh, and then other birds, too, that are using these grasslands or any other habitats that we want to restore. Deciduous woodland you know, species, red nape sapsuckers, really common up there. It's another bird we could look at. Common conspicuous birds. If we do decide, however we decide, we want to restore the grasslands up there, I think we're learning some really good tools. Uh, clustered seeds, uh, Matthew Madsen in uh, Burns, Oregon, ARS, coats seeds with either, um, you know, coatings that help retain water and aid seeds, or they have fertilizers in them. Uh, these seeds have fertilizers, fungicides, and capsaicin in them. So the capsaicin is supposed to keep rodents from eating them, rodents and birds. Because normally, if you just throw a bunch of seeds on the ground, they will get eaten, right? Uh, so we're experimenting with this a little bit. These are conifer seeds from the time when I thought I wanted that to all be conifers, but we could just as well be doing shrubs and grasses with this. I know that's what's happening at the ranch. This is a real simple study. These rows have just naked seeds in them, and then these are the coated seeds, different species, different coatings, and then this is a rodent exclosure so we can see what kind of maximum germination would be. But we can learn, we can learn from this how this works uh, up at North, 
we can also try it with different species. The AC coating stuff that I know Dan is going to talk about could be used. I'm also developing water resources up there. We have uh, water permits on the creek on two different point sources there. I have to use that water. We have one well, we can do another one. So we will have the availability of some supplemental water. And another thing I think would be useful in these fields is wildlife food plots, you know, like um, extreme cold tolerant grapes. Uh, and other cold tolerant fruit trees. It'd take a long time to get them going, but if we irrigated them, it'd go faster. Birds are gonna love it. And then we can film bears destroying them in 20 years, which I think would be super fun. Um, so those are all examples of things we can do in the fields. And those are just brief examples. I mean, I'd like to entertain all kinds of ideas. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of briefly touch on a couple of other uh, ideas I've had for habitat improvements. And I chose this header really carefully, and, and Philip kind of mentioned this this morning. I, I, increasingly, I'm very dissatisfied with the word restoration, and I try very hard not to use it. Because that word, the definition means turning back the clock, which is not possible, and I think in many cases isn't desirable. We're determining the trajectory of what this property is going to be, like it or not. If we do nothing, we've determined a trajectory. If we clear cut it and pave it and put a strip mall in it, we've determined the trajectory. Whatever it is that we do, we're determining a way forward. We're not restoring it. So I think of it as habitat improvements, and I want wildlife to be the beneficiary of that. Wildlife means microbes to grizzly bears. Another idea I've had is this entrance marsh area. Those of you that spent time up there know that we did this planning some years ago, and it's a total failure. We tried to mat this reed canary grass and plant red osier dogwood in it. It didn't work. This is almost all reed canary grass in here. I don't know what to do with this site. I have some ideas. Reed canary grass is very difficult to get rid of. Assuming we could kill the grass, what's going to happen next? Assuming we could get rid of the seed bank in an inundated wetland area, what would happen next? I'd like to see skunk cabbage and blue wild rye in there. I'd also like to see the thing deeper with some open water so we got more ducks. Those are big projects that uh, it's either going to involve heavy equipment or dynamite or something silly and crazy like that to get open water there, but I'd like to see something like that happen in the future. And finally, going back to these deciduous woodlands, uh, it's such a small amount of acreage, at least in terms of how it's mapped. Now, there's anyone who's been up there, there's a birch or an aspen or a cottonwood or something everywhere in here, but just a single deciduous tree doesn't make a deciduous woodland. It has to be kind of a stand, and we're trying to grow these over time. And so maybe the edges of the fields or maybe these open areas in the, you know, where should we put these woodlands? Because they seem to be really important. They kind of need to be around water. I think we've got a good opportunity here. So I'm going to show some data. This is kind of a little side tangent. This is a really old project uh, that Ben O'Connor and Philip Ramsey, Jeff, a couple other people were involved in years ago. And the, it was called forest thickening in the proposal uh, back then. Each of these orange circles is a 10th acre plot where we cut all the lodgepole and either just cut them and left them or we cut them and removed them or we removed them, slashed them, put the slash back and then we either scraped the duff or didn't from that area thinking that the increased light and different nutrients and the somewhat disturbance would create more tree species to grow and it would kind of alleviate the lodgepole even aged monoculture that's going on up there. It, it worked better, actually, than I thought it would. Um, I, I didn't really think anything was going to really change there. It was just going to be a bunch of dead lodgepole piled up in the forest. Um, and what we've seen, actually, and I can't, I'm not, I'm sorry, there's codes. It's just how it is. Um, what we see is that the trees that are coming back in all of these areas are, you know, Douglas fir, Grand fir, Larch, uh, Lodgepole, and Engelmann spruce, and a pretty even mix of all those tree species. So it's not just lodgepole that's coming back in there, which is kind of interesting in and of itself, because uh, lodgepole is what's there in the canopy uh, in these areas. Not much difference between the treatments, you know, if you fell and leave or fell and remove. The duff change, I mean, the, the error bars on this thing, yeah, I didn't have enough space on the slide to fit the error bars on here. So there's a lot of variation. The bottom line, though, is that the average region is 110 something trees per acre, which is a heck of a lot thinner than the lodgepole forest we cut down to begin with uh, in these areas. 10 foot spacing between trees, you end up with 440 tree, about 440 trees per acre. So 110 trees per acre is really far spacing. There's not very many seedlings coming back in these areas. 
Well, that's a great opportunity, right? Could we burn in these areas and plant some, uh, well, let me take one step back. Why didn't we get a lot of uh, regen in the trees? I think it's because the understory wasn't disturbed enough. Just raking up the duff isn't enough. Uh, cal uh, pine, pine grass, Calmagross disrubescent, pine, people. Pine grass uh, seems to be e extremely resistant to having things grow around it. It's just, when you see pine grass, it's pine grass for as far as it goes. I think that um, trees, uh, any plant is gonna have a tough time just spontaneously regenerating in there without a, a more severe disturbance. We haven't used burns as much as MPG North as I'd really like. It's a scary place to go and light a fire. I mean, there's million dollar properties all around you and, and you, know, you can only do it at the time when the whole thing would just go like crazy. But I think we can do better with burns and I'd like to use them a lot more. Um, so in these areas, I mean, look here, this is our lowest bird abundant spot. Look at all these points where we've already cleared the lodge pole. They'd be easy areas to go and do a prescribed burn. Maybe we could try some seed clusters. We can do some hand planting of aspen and voila, 10th acre aspen forest in like 50 years, right? I mean, that's a good spot to do it. And a lot of these other spots where the lodge pole has been cleared, same thing. It's adjacent to low bird richness areas. And I like birds are the only animals to watch for this, but I think Kate made a pretty good case of why birds are a good one. They're easy to measure. You don't have to invade them. You know, you don't have to molest them to, to measure them. And they use a smaller range. So um, that's something I'd really like to explore. And as soon as possible, we can go up there and burn, you know, next, next late fall probably. Um, okay, so that's just a couple of ideas that I have. I have a lot more, uh, and, and I'd like to continue. Uh, you know, it's a two-way dialogue. But the missions that I, so at the beginning, I said, you know, your mission if you choose to accept it. Well, uh, there are a couple of things that I'd like to just bring up as, as possibilities. Um, five? Okay, perfect. A couple of things I could bring up as possibilities. One is that content generation is still really important. Um, Spencer's gonna be talking about the, the new MPG North website, which is kind of nearing completion now. He's gonna be talking about that tomorrow. Content's really important. You know, Paul needs to know what we're doing and we, we want to continue our in, in increasing outreach with students and other organizations about the work we're doing. So field notes, photographs, blogs, all that stuff is gonna be more helpful with North, especially when we have the separate website as a place to put that. Our information won't just be going straight to Paul anymore, it's gonna be going to the public and that's gonna be happening soon. Um, so if you have time to go up there for a day and do a two page field note with four photographs and three sentences on it, they don't need to be elaborate. More small, easily digestible bites is really good content for the web and that's what we want. It's also easy to collect relevant informative data. Take a GPS unit and a pair of snowshoes and a sandwich and go track a bobcat for four hours. It's really fun, especially when you see their tracks, they take off into a gallop across the snow because they saw that snowshoe hair over there and you think, oh, I know I'm gonna find a kill over there and then you don't. <laughs> it's exciting and we can use more of that data. Um, if everyone visited up there two or three days this year, just the number of people who routinely spend their days in the field at the ranch in this room, how much more content would that be than what Lorinda and I and a couple other people are generating right now? It'd be really helpful and it's not that big of a time commitment. And if you have any colleagues, I'm working with Scott Mills right now and some of his undergrad students on a snowshoe hair phenology study. We're using the camera images to do it. It's not taking a ton of time. It didn't cost a lot of money. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for people that want to work with small animals or birds or plants or forestry. We can manipulate up there. We can cut lodgepole. We can burn areas. We can plant things. Um, as long as it's in line with our restoration goals, we could offer um, you know, sites for research to people. So if, if you hear anyone talking about it, sounds like it'd be a good idea, let me know. Specific stuff, this is all just reminders, I already said that birds, I'm really curious how they're using the habitat. Anything that we're able in the future to throw at that I think would be really handy. Birds are a much bigger and cooler story at the ranch. I don't mean to, to, to downplay that at all. Uh, you know, this is a small property, but I still think we can learn a lot without tremendous investment. Uh, the fields and wetlands projects, wildlife monitoring and camera research I didn't talk about for very long, but we're going to have a huge data set and I, I won't even begin to be able to exhaust the potential with that. If anyone wants to do some analysis on it, I'll give you the login to the database and train you quickly on how to use it and you're good to go. 
Um, and then any other ideas, if, if you're just one thing, I, I'd like people to go up there and do field notes so that they come to me and say, hey, have you thought about this? Because I probably haven't, and, or maybe I haven't, and it might be a great idea. Finally, this isn't a one-way street. I'm not saying, hey, I expect everyone in this room to go to north and drop what you're doing. <laughs> to the extent that any of this stuff gives me some more time, I really want to go down to the ranch and work with you. You know, I want to do some stuff. To, I want to do some bird work at the ranch. I want to do some more, uh, you know, invasive fungal pathogens, endophytes work, like Ilva and I have been doing a little bit of. I want to work uh, with Nate on bitter brush, bitter brush endophytes, and mule deer ecology. Uh, I, I would like to have a little bit more backwards and forwards with that. So I think that's about all I've got. So my message is keep on eating. Whether you're at the ranch or at North, we're not done. We haven't finished the carcass. I love what we're doing. So let's keep on eating. Thank you. <laughs>